I'm Mike Molinet, one of the founders of Dina. Uh, we've been working together with Incident for a number of years. And <clears throat> with my previous company at Branch, we were also customers of Incident, um, <clears throat> and which it was an amazing experience for us handling all of our internal uh, incident response. So uh, excited to get things kicked off today, Ryan. Uh, maybe we can start with just a little bit of intro about you. And then if you can share a little bit about incidents and what you guys do, and then we'll kind of take it from there. Sure. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Hoskin. I'm the VP of Customer Success at Incident.io. Uh, we are in the incident management space, so we help teams facilitate uh, response to sort of swarm around incidents so that they can resolve the issue and then uh, learn from them. Uh, the company is about two and a half years old. I've been in the space for a very long time, uh, previously at PageDD, and then before that, uh, on-call engineer myself. Um, so that's a bit about me. Um, I've been at Incident for about six months now, and it's been really interesting seeing how we have leveraged technologies like Fina in order to provide like a really, really, really customer-centric experience. And it's been uh, a great partnership so far. Cool. <clears throat> and we we're chatting a little bit before we got started about how how much you've used Slack both at Incident, but also your previous companies and even before Slack using things like HipChat. So very familiar with the space, it sounds like. Um, today, we're going to be talking about scaling Slack support. And I think you guys are doing some very interesting things even from the, the moment we started working together uh, at Branch. I remember having a Slack channel with you guys a number of years ago. Um, and there's a lot of great interest in this webinar, specifically in terms of scaling that up and how you manage Slack channels in once you get into the hundreds, really, um, mm -hmm. and how you see that significance for modern companies that are doing this. So um, let me just kind of introduce the topic a little bit. So we, and kind of give a little bit of background, because um, we started working together at branch when we were trying to figure out how we scale and some management what we found was that a lot of everything that we were doing was in slack and you guys spun up a slack channel with us to help us get onboarded and the rest is history from there um maybe you can start just a little bit kind of lay the foundation for everybody help us understand a little bit about at incident how you guys kind of approach using slack how it's the primary like the primary means of communication with your customers and then we can kind of go from there yeah, so pretty much every single one of our customers has a joint Slack channel with us. Um, and we actually have not only like our go to market, like our sales and success and support folks in those channels, we actually have a ton of engineers as well. So we've got um, hundreds of Slack channels, um, which sounds daunting, um, you know, without a tool like Fina. Um, but Fina really enables us to like manage that at scale. Um, the way that we approach uh, engaging with customers, it's from everything from like pre-sales, POV, like connecting with the customers, you know, managing the sales cycle to the post-sales transition and engaging with them on everything from support issues to bugs to feature requests or just general engagement with the customers. And the way that it feels is like we're essentially an extension of their team. Um, and I feel super close with um, a lot of my customers just because I talk to them almost daily. And not only that, um, like I said, we have our engineering team actually in a lot of those channels and um, they will take it upon themselves to actually just directly engage with customers. We don't sort of um, block them from having that direct engagement. And that's actually something that we sort of hire for from the engineering side um, is folks that are keen to talk to customers. And it creates this like really great feedback loop. Not only do engineers see that they're, what they're shipping actually gets pushed into production, but they get that positive validation from customers where they're getting, you know, affirmation like, hey, thanks for resolving that issue um, and things like that. So it creates these like really magical customer moments where an engineer might be deploying something, they see that uh, there was an issue and they can quickly resolve that issue and then validate with the customer that it's done. And it's, it just creates these like exceptional customer moments, like daily. It's really wild. I think that's one of the kind of more rare things that I've seen you guys do compared to other companies, which is actually including engineers and there's no right or wrong way to do it, but you guys get a yeah. lot of benefit from that. Do you guys, do you think about, and have you guys put any like protection or guardrails in place to prevent a situation where the engineers maybe get overwhelmed and aren't spending time doing development work? Or how do you guys structure that to ensure that they're still focused on the right things at the right time? 
Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a balance, right? Like, it, and it can also be, you know, distracting if an engineer's in a hundred different channels and like what's noise and what's not. So um, we sort of leave it at their discretion. You know, I've only been here for six months, but I haven't seen that actually become an issue. If anything, it helps with like accelerating the development life cycle and things like that. Um, so we don't really put any sort of guardrails on that. The, the engineers are sort of left to their own devices, but like primarily the CSMs and the support organization is, are the people that are responding to customers, but it's like, mm. it's not uncommon for an engineer to see something and take action on it right away. So for instance, um, we have a community Slack channel. There was a, a minor issue in our change log today. I noticed it right away in parallel. One of our engineers saw it went straight to the right person and we had that resolved within like five minutes. So wow. it's those sort of interactions that are like really common within the company. Yeah. You mentioned it accelerates development. Any any like hypotheses on why that accelerates development? Is it better understanding of the customer needs and issues or is it other stuff? Yeah. Think? Yeah. So I mean um engineers will pay attention to like what customers are asking for. So they'll see a lot of like feature requests, things like that. And they'll they'll just go directly to the customer when they're, you know, um, whether they're scoping out a new feature or like need to validate an idea, they'll just ping the customer directly, right? So you don't have to like, you're not waiting to like schedule a meeting or like, you know, like it just, you get an instantaneous response from customers. So it like just makes it very quick to get that positive validation from customers uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like what you're building and whether you're on the right track. Okay, makes sense. And you mentioned community. Uh, I want to come back to community kind of later in the discussion mm -hmm. because I think that there's sure. some interesting things there. Um, we talked about being close with customers. Can you talk, expand a little bit upon that about the benefits and the value that you see in terms of building that relationship, feeling like you're an extension of the team? Yeah, I mean, um, it's it just makes it so simple to connect with someone, right? Like Slack is so informal um, that like, mm -hmm. It's not like sending an email to someone where you have to like make sure that it's um, <laughs> covers everything that it's like very formal. Um, like it just you really do feel like an extension of the team because you're like talking to them about stuff in real time all the time um, and you're just available for them. So uh, I think just the closeness of it and like the lack of um, minor hurdles, whether that's like sending an email or something else, just because it's instantaneous communication, just like the medium just makes it feel a lot different. Yeah, I've heard that before as well from a lot of other folks too, kind of like the informal nature of it makes it feel like people can message, ask questions without such a high bar. So it makes, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. In like a pre-Slack world, like using emojis and things like that with a customer would be something that I would never have considered. And like now that's commonplace, right? So like I talk to them as if, you know, yeah, they're my customer, but like I treat, I talk to them very similarly to how I would talk to my coworkers, which is mm -hmm. really nice. Yeah, I really like that. Um, okay, so just to set context for everyone, so you mentioned you have Slack channels with pretty much all your customers. Would you say with every one of, or nearly every one of your customers, you have a Slack channel that you're engaging with them in? Yeah. Okay. Probably like ninety cool. five percent. Yes. Okay. And do you do you ever gate having a Slack channel? with a customer or is it mainly if they don't want to have a Slack channel with you, like for that 5% that don't have it, how do you guys think about that? Um, we don't have like a, a strict rule on that. Like oftentimes they're going to be spun up like a pre-sale cycle. If it's a sales assisted deal, um, if it's like a self-serve customer that we haven't really had much interaction with, then that's probably where they would sort of like um, not get that level of attention. But we try mm -hmm. to make it easy for all of our customers to get a hold of us. Um, and you could gate it on things like, you know, pricing plans and whatnot, but we try to just be as connected as possible. Um, we found that it hasn't generated like a disruptive amount of noise. Um, so it's been, it's been working well for us. Okay. Really? Yeah. Really nice. Um, why don't we dive a little bit into kind of some of the challenges when we think about managing Slack channels yeah. with customers, because this is a common concern, right? This is a totally. new way of working. Companies, vendors, customers kind of are starting to do this more and more. It's happening, yeah. uh, whether we like it or not, but it comes with challenges. And, and so we'd love to hear from your perspective, either from previous companies, as well as at Instant, albeit you came in, I think, after uh, the team had started using it. Um, what are the challenges that you've seen historically uh, with Slack with customers? Um. 
The biggest issue is ownership and making sure that nothing falls through the cracks, right? So, you know, half, five plus years ago, um, when Slack Connect started becoming a thing, my CSMs were just like spinning up channels on their own. And there was no way to like have any oversight into that. And so as a manager, I was just like, sort of wipe my hands clean and be like, if you're going to get on that channel, like you have to own making sure that we're getting back to those customers. So it was sort of like wild west of um, responding to people. Um, and it was, I knew that there was going to be a, a solution like Dina eventually, but like at that point in time, it was just so early days with Slack Connect that it was like, just go do your thing. It's inconsistently done um, instantly as a manager because I didn't have visibility into like, what was happening with all of these different customers. Um, the other approach that I've taken at another place was like, we had a very high level of support, but um, we only provided Slack channels for like a very select, like top few customers. And so yep. each um, support rep was like only responsible for a couple of channels, right? So it was very easy for them to manage. Um, and, but that's also like a resourcing and staffing issue, right? Like it realistically, are you going to have support folks that are just managing a couple of channels for a couple of key customers? Um, so that, that's also a challenge. Um, other things like we roll out our change log um, directly through Slack using the marketing automation tool. We used to manually do that every single week and we, we, we ship fast. And so we have a change log essentially every Friday. Um, and that was a huge manual effort, which obviously like does not scale well. So um, being able to automate that and then immediately get feedback via um, Zapier to like see how customers are reacting to it and being able to respond to people that like respond to our change log um, is also like something that used to be done manually and now it's all just done like we have central visibility into all of that stuff. Uh, also like um, Slack itself and threads are it's very easy to like not completely close the loop on things the Slack message moves moves up as time goes on mm. and all of a sudden you forget about it. And so um, it makes it very easy for issues to not ever get fully closed. And, you know, that's a problem when you're work, trying to resolve customer issues or bugs and things like that. And then one of the things we were chatting about yesterday is also the visibility too, for leadership, being able to have kind of- yeah, visibility and metrics. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean- in, you know, for instance, like I've, I've been um, looking at the way that we onboard new customers and like, what, what does that mean specifically for like an enterprise customer? Like, what is the burden that it places on my team? What is the level of effort that we need in order to make them successful? And if it was just a bunch of random Slack threads, I would have no visibility into like what that actual workload or capacity management would need to be. Um, and so when I look at, you know, we're going through fiscal year 24 planning and it's like, how should I forecast, you know, what sort of resources I need? And I can now have like solid metrics based on real data around what it actually takes to onboard new customers. So that when I get the forecast from sales of like, this is where we're going to go next year, I can then back out of that with data to, to support it actually to figure out like what resources I need to, um, to manage customers effectively. Because otherwise you're just sort of shooting blind, right? Um, and given that this is the primary method in which we engage with customers and we support our customers, there's really no other parallel sort of metric that I could use to track that, like Zendesk tickets or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you guys don't use Zendesk, if I recall correctly, or don't do really much email support. Is that right? Probably 5% of our tickets come via okay. email or through um, web chat, but it's very small. Okay. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's I think through... Yeah, I mean, because we're a Slack-based tool and our um, our customers live in Slack, it's like meet your customers where you are sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like there's zero uplift for them to Slack us for as, you know, going to our website or open up the email client or whatever is just like that little bit of hindrance for them to actually like engage with us. Yep. Do you have concerns about like not having a bar of kind of forcing somebody to fill out a form because some some companies will have like go to our website fill out this form collect a bunch of data how do you think about yeah. that in kind of this in this world my philosophy generally i mean being a b2b you know mid market plus company um has been to make it as easy as possible for customers to get the support that they need i'd rather to reduce barriers there i could see if we were like a 
you know, we if we had fifty thousand SMB customers, like it probably would not work so well, or it'd be a bit more challenging. But um, probably varies business to business. But like in my world where I live today, like remove the barriers, make it easy for people to get support, um, just because it provides like such great customer satisfaction, such great relationships, such a great vendor experience um, that like it pays dividends. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think it's a good distinction, right? If you have 50,000 customers or if you're B2C, much harder to do you know, yep. this type of thing. And even to use something like Zendesk is really complex. You probably have, are going to have a huge support team if you're doing that. But when it comes to B2B, especially smaller yep. number, hundreds, maybe a thousand, maybe 1,500, 2,000 customers. Um, and you can kind of carve those off as well. Yep. That makes it a little bit more scalable. Totally. The, um, the other thing that you mentioned there is I've heard some people describe it as, and I used to think about this as well. If you make it too hard for your customers to actually submit something, a question, an issue, mm -hmm. a bug report, they end up suffering in silence. And that's actually worse than maybe receiving their request, but with a little bit less information. So that was kind of Absolutely. my philosophy as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you lose out on some things like, um, you know, like categorization, or if you need to route a ticket to a specific team, because like, in like making them enter that, we're not big enough to have to deal with those issues. But like, you know, things like AI tags and all that sort of stuff, just based on the like sentiment of the conversation, like maybe you could do some sort of routing with that. But like, um, we're just not there yet, I think, as a company, but it, it hasn't been a problem in our product. Um, breadth is not big enough where we have to have that specialization. So um, it seems to work for us right now. Cool. Yeah. And I think you touch on something important, which is AI is going to streamline some of this, being able to pull in information and then be able to route things automatically, which I think should, should help. Certainly. Um, I mean, like okay. even now, like I see even just with like the, the sentiment that your tool provides, that's like, it's this customer and I see it's a higher urgency or high severity thing with like poor sentiment or something like that. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to this. Like that sort of stuff is, is already helpful. Cool. You mentioned kind of capacity planning. This is kind of an interesting one because it, it comes up uh, pretty regularly and it's, it's always been a black box for a lot of teams, not knowing the work mm -hmm. that's happening in Slack, um, especially across the entire customer base. Anything else that like you want to share there in terms of the visibility that it provides and how you're thinking about, for example, capacity planning and resourcing uh, as you guys think about 2024, for example? Yeah. Um, so as an example, I was just looking at like one of our major enterprise customers and like what their onboarding experience was like, because they were one of our um, to date largest sort of Slack users in terms of like volume. Um, and they also are just like um, uh, closing down or winding down their rollout process. So I have like full visibility into like what it looked like pre uh, pre-sale and then what is that post sales experience look like and it was just interesting seeing like the volume of chats that we had pre sales like not insignificant but as soon as the deal closed it like skyrocketed i felt that personally because i there were periods of time where i was like doing direct frontline support with them and it would be just like question 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 right so that experience was very difficult to um to support from a staffing standpoint but looking back at that, like the last three months with this customer, like really gave me insight into like what that sort of like initial surge is when a new customer closes. And then I can see how that's starting to taper down. And then using that data, I can then, you know, sort of extrapolate like, okay, here's the time zones that I need people here are um, the amount of tickets I should expect based on how many customers we're going to close based on like certain size deals and all that sort of stuff. So it provided me like very actionable insights into like, what is, how do our customers engage with us? And then like, how, how should I forecast that going forward? It's really interesting. And the, the time zone piece is especially interesting because you can see now the, when the requests are coming in, when they start, and even though you know where your customer base is, being able to see, yeah. hey, it peaks at afternoon UTC, that can tell yeah. you what kind of resourcing you need and where. I thought that was Absolutely. really interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we use um, that exact metric to figure out like how we're going to staff. I mean, our team is relatively small mm -hmm. still, but like I will 100% be using that going forward. I love that. And can you touch a little bit upon how you guys use Slack in the pre-sales process? Because I know you guys do that as well. And I think that's pretty common um, and kind of how that then rolls into the post-sales process. 
Yeah. Um, so pre-sales, our sales reps will get a channel spun up. We run a bot that like loops in all the appropriate people, uh, adds the unit, et cetera. Um, and then the sales reps pretty much own that experience. Um, they will pull in, um, right now we're pulling in post sales team to like success managers to help with the POV process. Um, and it's just sort of like, um, I would say it's fairly casual. Like it's just talking with the, you know, the decision makers, the people going through the POV um, to help them with troubleshooting, helping them with onboarding, basic things like that. Um, and then as soon as it transitions to post-sales, like there really isn't from a, a Slack standpoint, much of a change other than we now got a CSM like fully introduced, owning that onboarding experience and partnering with them to make sure they have a successful rollout. So like nothing really changes. The, it may, the Slack channel may be called deal and now it's called customer dash something. Um, but that's, that's, that's about it. Um, so nothing really changes and it's a very smooth transition for, for our customers as well. Like they don't have to, they already know and are accustomed to engaging with us on Slack. So their expectations are set in terms of like the quality of response they're going to get. Um, and also that's sort of like a, uh, a very positive experience that our customers get and helps us win deals actually by having just that close engagement and just showing how quality of a um, customer support experience we can provide even in the pre-sales process. So that's, that's a big differentiator of ours. Okay. Yeah. Really interesting. And I think that is a differentiator and the, I mean, you guys are really end to end on Slack. So from the moment you have a real opportunity, the sales process, the proof of concept, the post-sales process and implementation and all the way through, yeah. like you said, marketing, release notes, that sort of stuff and customer yeah. success kind of end to end is happening in Slack. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to recap uh, kind of some of the challenges we heard, and then would love to hear about some of the things that you've done to solve some of those challenges. Before I do that, for those that are online, uh, there's a Q and A box in the Zoom webinar feel free to drop questions in there. You can also upvote questions if you see one that you like. Uh, and then we will either weave those in throughout or we'll get to those at the end. <clears throat> so Ryan, what I heard is when it came to some of the challenges that you've seen with Slack with customers, ownership is a big one, making sure that people are owning things, nothing slipping through the cracks. Visibility, both in terms of kind of metrics and re understanding resourcing and just knowing what's going on in these customer channels, which historically has been kind of an unknown, leading to what some people call ghost work. Um, the closing the loop, forgetting kind of things get buried. Slack can be very ephemeral, and sometimes there might be a, a thread or a request that is in progress, but that can get buried and get lost and you don't necessarily yeah. know um, until the customer a couple of weeks later pings you and says, what's going on with this? Um, yeah. And then you mentioned kind of marketing automation or broadcasting, be, being able to send out messages to a number of channels. And I remember when I first met Lucy on your team, she was every week, every Friday, copying, pasting the release notes into every single channel that you had hundreds of times. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> and so for her being able to, draft it once and yeah. click send and it go out to all the channels was really a game changer as well and a big time saver for her. Absolutely. Um, so so those are the, some of the challenges that we faced or that you faced and that we've seen. Let's talk a little bit about as you guys work to fix this, as you integrated Dina, kind of like what are some of the benefits or what are some of the solutions that you're seeing and what's really resonating with each of these challenges or how are you solving each of these uh, yeah, I mean, like we talked talk through some of those things, right? So the marketing automations for like that one-to-many sort of communications has been an absolute game changer for us. Um, also, the like consolidating feedback using um, Zapier's uh, integration um, to like provide real-time feedback on what, what our customers are saying about the change logs and whatnot has been absolutely um, instrumental for us. Um, the oversight and insights, uh, like there's the insights provide directly in the Athena tool, but also just like getting a dump of the data and importing it into our data warehouse to um, give additional visibility has been like super impactful for, for me as a manager to understand like what are the commonalities of issues that we're seeing with customers, like what are common themes, what's the volume of tickets, um, what does that look like over time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, can't really think of anything else to dig into there, but like if you have other questions, happy to go deeper. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that I've seen 
is how well your team kind of keeps track of everything. Meaning <clears throat> if anything gets, well, nothing really gets missed because I think your team is on top yeah. of it. But I think part of that is being able to get alerts and being able to see, hey, this message that came in from a Slack channel hasn't been addressed. And then somebody, mm -hmm. Lucy, Georgie, somebody on your team is able to, to look into that. And I think that's been one thing. And then from a leadership perspective, I'm curious, like how your day-to-day -day looks when it comes to the Slack channels. Are you in all the Slack channels? Are you in just some of them? Do you yeah. look at the Athena dashboard, the Athena app home, the triage channel? Tell us about your workflow as a leader. Sure. Um, so I, I'm in every channel um, and I actually get pinged for every uh, new, you know, sort of Athena ticket. Um, so I have visibility into what's going on. I don't, I don't poke at every single one, but I do periodically will go through and review them. So um, my workflow, the way that my day goes and how I leverage Athena is one, I'm seeing stuff happening in real time. Um, we have folks working um, in the UK and on the West Coast here. Um, so like my first thing in the morning, we'll be coming, check and get a pulse on sort of like what things look like from overnight. Um, and then uh, see if we have like a huge backlog of issues or anything that we need to address. That doesn't happen super often, often because um, with our like internal SLAs that we have, we get visibility when like folks start to get behind. Um, so other folks from across the company will chip in, whether that's from success or engineering, like they may just hop directly and engage with the customer. Um, so I'll throughout the day, I, I will check the um, Thena dashboard just to see like how many, what's the like backlog of open tickets right now. If I have the capacity, I, I will also just hop on and help out if I if I feel it's needed or if I see a particular issue that's like, an area that I have expertise or I'm like very close to that customer, uh, I may take that. Um, and then uh, pure, not daily, but like regularly, I'm looking at the metrics like overall to see how like the month is trending and like the volume of tickets and whether anything is materially changed there. And, um, you know, probably on a, a monthly basis using it for more of like a forecasting exercise. Very nice. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I thought was interesting too was you're using AI assigned tags to kind of see what the trends are as mm -hmm. well, where you can, so like we'll, we'll apply, use AI to kind of assign different tags to each of the requests. So you yeah. can start seeing the themes. I don't know if you've gotten any value out of that yet, or if it's still too early, um, but I thought no, that was a really no. interesting case. It, it's probably a bit too early, um, but because we've only had been leveraging that for like the last month or two. But uh, the way that we work with our different product organizations is that they would probably want to see the volume of things that are um, uh, Im impacted by their product, right? Mm -hmm. Or if there's like a lot of questions coming in for a particular product, like say after a product launch or something like that. Um, and they're keen to get feedback on that sort of stuff in real time. So like after a product launch, you'll see them often like um, leaning into like responding to customers right away, especially like right after that initial launch. Cool. And when product yeah. engineers are coming in and responding to customers, who typically, so one of the things Athena does is when a request or a threat is happening, there's a notion of an assign, assignee. Mm -hmm. So you know who's owning it. Do your engineers, yeah. product engineers, take assignment of those? Or is it typically the CSMs that will own assignment, even if the product engineer is engaging on the thread? How do you guys do that? Uh, the product engineers will take ownership. Um, they will also, which was... Uh, something that took me a bit to adjust to um, say we have a bug report or like a, a small feature request that we file as an engineering ticket. Um, we'll, we'll link back to that Slack thread and mm -hmm. it's more often than not the engineer, like when they resolve that issue or fix that, implement that feature request, um, then they often will just go directly to the customer and be like, Hey, I've uh, implemented this thing. And it, it caught me off guard because I'd see them closing out their near tickets and I'd be like, you didn't put a resolution in. Like, I need to know to go back to the customer. And they're like, I already reached out to them. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, so that was that was a new muscle for me. And it's like, it's pretty amazing to see in action, actually. Um, but no, yeah. we they take ownership of it. But like our our support org, like ultimately is responsible for the um, uh, the backlog of sort of open issues right now. So they'll, they'll periodically like peruse what's, you know, in on hold or pending or whatever and actually like clean that up. Very nice. Um, you mentioned that you're in every Slack channel with customers right now, and you actually, you don't mm -hmm. have to mute it. It sounds like you actually will see what's going on in those Slack channels. When you think about, I don't know if you've thought about this, but when you think about doubling your customer account over the next year or two, let's say this scales to 
yeah, let's just say it doubles to compared to what it sure. is. Yeah. Anything that you think is going to change from your perspective as a leader with how you engage with these channels or look at the channels? Mm, I probably won't get notified for every single uh, issue. Um, I'll probably have to have some way of filtering that out so that I'm just not completely inundated all the time. Um, frankly, I'm not even like remotely concerned about like doubling or tripling or even like 10 xing where we're at, honestly, because it just scales really well and it is totally manageable um, with the way that we're doing things. Um, so like no real major concerns. I think it's like, continuing to do what we're doing today maybe have some um specialization of the team if we expand our platform to like you know different areas but um no drastic concerns frankly okay that's uh exciting to hear that you think that doubling tripling 10xing it, it yeah. all continues to support um i think that's our that's our vision as well enabling teams like yourself to be able to do that uh yeah. Okay, so why don't we shift gears a little bit? <clears throat> so you're talking about Slack Connect channels. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier community as well. And yeah. community tends to be a increasing thing that I'm seeing with a lot of companies. I would say about half of our customers have a community workspace separate from their main workspace where they might have one-to-one -one Slack Connect channels with customers. How are yeah. you guys thinking about community? Kind of where are you at in that evolution? And how do you think about and how community is used differently or in similar ways to the individual Slack channels with customers? I would say that our um, maturity of our community in terms of how we're managing it and leveraging it is probably on the, the less mature side of things. I mean, it exists. We have thousand plus users in there. Um, but it is a little interesting dynamic, as you point out. We have our direct Slack Connect channels, and then we also have this sort of like in parallel community um, some of those folks are going to be people that we may not have a direct Slack channel with. Some folks are in both. Um, some There's some individuals that prefer to just engage in the community first, potentially to get a response from someone else in the community um, to see how they do things. Um, so it's it's a mix. I think that um, the power of the community is in when you can like get customers together to help one another out or like talk, share best practices and things like that. Um, it also is a great support channel. Um, so those are the areas that I see it being slightly different. Um, like we're obviously not going to talk about like internal configuration of a customer or anything like that. Like it, it, on the private channels or the connect channels, we can be much more like specific around like their, their actual account and whatnot versus the community. You got to be very cognizant that there's, you know, a thousand other eyes looking at this thing. Um, but it seems to work really well. Like we, respond to customers quickly. They get the answer they're looking for. Um, it's nicer than them, um, you know, emailing us or something like that. And um, hopefully it'll build some connections across our customer base. Cool. Do you guys have kind of a target size of company or employee count that you tend to target above when it comes to your ICP? Or do you guys kind of take any, any size of company? I mean, we're mostly focused on like mid-market, uh, and plus sort of customers, more like technology centric customers, like we might not be going after an insurance company or something like that, you know, um, and that that sort of overlaps with like people who are going to be on Slack are likely to be a more innovative company um, is my guess. Um, and that's sort of the way that we target our customers. Um, we're very much a sales led motion. So like, again, like mid market enterprises where we're going to live and we've got some some of the largest enterprises that you can think of uh, customers already. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, and I ask because I think the community piece is interesting, but I think what it depends on the size of the customer that typically companies go after where I see mm -hmm. community work really well and have a higher volume and be kind of more central to the strategy is when you have kind of a long tail of customers. Yeah. These could be really SMB, maybe even self-serve customers that don't warrant having a individual Slack channel. And so yeah. that might be where you have the community of people paying a few hundred bucks a month, maybe a very yeah. small team, um, and that you want to push them to community. But when they get up, up up to a certain size, having dedicated channels with them can be really advantageous. And I think that's the approach that you guys have taken, which is really nice. 
Yeah, I think that's the exact way to approach that. Okay, cool. Anything else when it comes to Athena that you have uh, really seen in terms of benefits, advantages, or any other things that we haven't touched on so far? I just can't emphasize enough how um, great it feels as a manager to have visibility <laughs> into all of the things that are happening and just have the comfort that things aren't going to fall through the cracks um, because those were all the things that gave me so much angst in previous lives. Um, I just, it's, it's phenomenal. And like just the constant validation we get like in real time with customers about how they feel about like the product we're shipping or resolving issues or just providing an excellent support experience is second to none really. I've, I've seen firsthand and heard firsthand from some of your customers how much they value your team and, and the support that hands-on support that they give you. So you give them. So uh, very well done. Um, okay, so for folks that are on the line, feel free to use the Q and A if you have any questions that you want to ask. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be switching to open Q and A. Um, when you were to think, if you were to think about kind of what's missing, what do you wish exist? Anything on the wish list from, from your perspective, your things that we've talked about already that will be coming or things that you haven't shared that you, if you, in a perfect world, anything could happen that you would like to see. Yeah. I mean, some of the things we've shared is like feature requests, like eventually we're going to expand beyond Slack to teams. Right. And so having the support for that is a direction we're going to go and it'll hopefully unlock a, an entire separate customer base that we're not focused on yet today. Um, that's a big one. Um, I shared with you some of the like in-house metrics that we've built and I would ex expect some of that to be incorporated into the product. But for today, like we've got pretty good visibility into all the things that I feel are important from a metric standpoint. Um, that's about it. I think the product, like it's we, it's a fairly simple use case, and the way that we leverage the product is fairly simple. But like it, it very much meets our needs. Um, you know, additional things like different integrations with like different ticketing systems and stuff like mm -hmm. that will also be helpful. Like one of our workflows is um, our engineers work in linear, and um, you know, so we we tie our um, Athena tickets over to linear tickets, but having like a full bi-directional integration with that sort of system to like allow us to work cross-functionally in a more automated and simplistic way would be very beneficial to us, but it's not a complete hair on fire problem for us. If I which have, you'll any. have... <laughs> which you'll, uh, you'll soon have access to that. And the, in yeah, the interesting thing about teams and we we're chatting about it before uh, we kind of kicked off the webinar is it's just a totally different cohort of customers that when you open up Teams access, you have, and what we've seen with a lot of our customers is um, they might have the vast majority of their customer base on Slack and maybe a small percentage, 5, 10, 15, 20% on Teams, but those tend to yeah. be the larger enterprises. And so while Absolutely. it might be a smaller proportion in count, it's a higher proportion in revenue or ARR. And so that's the importance of the Teams connectors and the old world of, having to pop over the teams and reply in teams and have a totally different workspace is no longer when you can live in Slack and have those yeah. teams customers be able to come into Slack. So I think that's really Absolutely. exciting. Yeah. The other exciting thing that you guys are rolling out is the um, email integration and as well mm -hmm. as the, the web chat integration. So like now my support and CSMs have like literally a single place to live and a single pane of, pane of glass to look at to pull in all the different channels that we have to engage with customers, which is uh, a very welcome change. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's a really exciting you know, innovation and kind of progress because to your point, over time, it's kind of become fragmented, right? For yeah. CS teams and support teams. So really excited for you guys to, to use those products. Um, Want to shift to... One of my final questions, which is advice that you might have for folks, but let me let me set the context here. Um, there's probably a couple different types of people that are on the call right now, or maybe listening to the recording. There's some that are all in on Slack with their customer base, and they're simply thinking about how do I scale this up, and what do I need mm -hmm. to do to go from 100 channels to 200 channels to 400 channels, and what are the best practices that teams like Incident have done. But there's a separate cohort, and this is the one I'd love for you to address because we spent most of the time focused on, I think, the first cohort. The second cohort is people that are maybe on the fence. Maybe they they have some Slack channels. It just kind of naturally happened because sales 
a team opened up Slack channels and they've fallen into having 50, 75, 100 Slack channels. And they're unsure yeah. whether or not that's something that they want to continue offering. Mm -hmm. um, any advice that you have or tips for those people ha of how to think about like of that, how to think about that problem, that question, if they're in the, some leadership team meeting and they're debating, what would you, what yeah. advice would you give them? Um, I, I would think about like, if, if in um, how you should gate that, like, is it a specific subset of customers that qualify for that level of support? Is it potentially a paid offering or something like that? Um, that's one thing. Two, I would um, be very strict around um, the Slack policy and things like naming convention. Um, so you know that like this is a customer specific channel uh, and be consistent in enforcement of that. Um, I would recommend making sure it's a consistent experience across the board. So leveraging a tool like Fina to make sure that like, you know, nothing, nothing falls through the cracks and that you have full visibility and you are responding to customers over Slack in a consistent way. Um, and I would just say like, it sounds terrifying to be committed to being in a ton of different customer Slack channels. Like as a support leader, I've been in this game a very long time. The first time I heard of that, it like, took my breath away. I was like, good Lord, how are we ever going to, you know, manage this? And, um, if you have the right tooling in place, it's, it becomes a very, very manageable. Um, so I would say just don't be scared of, um, what that looks like, because once you actually get into it and if you have the right processes in place, it makes it like very easy to manage and provide some really delightful customer experiences. Um, love that. And if there's any questions from the audience, feel free to drop them in. Uh, so Ryan, from your perspective, anything else that you'd like to share with the folks listening or watching the recording? Um, no. Um, if you if you're curious or want to connect, you know, you can always find me on our our Slack community. Um, but like I said, it's been um wonderful leveraging Thena um to make my life easier to like really connect closely with our customers. And um I was telling Mike before this, like I used to be sort of a Slack hater. Um, and I, when Slack was announcing that uh, they were going to replace email, I thought that was the most ridiculous thing on earth. Um, but I was completely wrong, just like I was wrong about how um, big Slack would become. So uh, I am now a full convert and um, really, really enjoy this because it, it provides so many positive benefits for our customers and for our company. I love it. And you and the whole incident team have really been innovators in the space. I think you guys are blazing the trail that other companies are following and, and emulating. So huge kudos to, to you, to Lucy, to Steven, to Pete, to everybody on the incident team. Um, really impressed with the way in which you've done this and, and the vision that you have for how this scales as well. And we've been, we've been really honored to be a part of that and to help you guys scale throughout. Um, thank you. And so want to thank you, Ryan, uh, for those that, haven't or don't have an incident management tool. We've been customers at Branch of uh, uh, Incident for years and huge fan of what they're doing. Um, and so if you need uh, support or incident management, check them out. And then Ryan, really huge thank you to everything for sharing all your insights, all your learnings and all your advice for everyone on the call. So really, really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, it's been fun. Awesome, all right, everybody. We'll catch you later. Uh, Ryan, I'll be ending the webinar and it'll probably kick us out, but thanks for joining and see you out there. Okay, thanks. Bye everyone. Bye.